Hi, welcome back to my channel. Never thought I'd be saying those words, but here we are. It's a privilege to be able to journey alongside you all in life, um, whoever it is that ends up coming across this video. And I was told from my last video that it was actually the editing that felt the least natural part of my sharing. So I'm not gonna edit this one. Might be a skosh longer, um, but just wanting to kind of show up and have a conversation with people. So today I wanna talk about a book that I just finished. It's called You're Not Listening by Kate Murphy. It was referred to me by a friend of mine named Robbie Green, who is a very, very smart person and just felt really transformed by her work. So here we are. And it definitely is one of those books. I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you read it and then you start to see the concepts just popping up absolutely everywhere. Like you are like, ah, oh, yeah. I mean, if only people would read this book, they would, you know, do better at this thing. So it's definitely one of those books, which is, which is really fun. But, um, that happens to me like once a week, <laughs> just so you know, with books. But I do think this concept of listening is really transformative. It comes to into my life at a really timely place as I am transitioning from a life of ministry in the evangelical church um, that in, in my experience focused a lot on telling and trying to provide truth to people and sort of uh, help people along into um, a predefined destination. Um, and now I think more of my personal goal as a coach is to have a more gentle, have a more gentle way of serving people through listening. And I'm finding that um, people have this immense strength and goodness in them um, and an ability to keep moving on their journeys uh, in a way that's so incredibly productive um, and beautiful when they just take the time to sit down and actually focus on those things. So that's kind of what I want to be a part of um, in this next season of my life. Um, so listening is what coaching is at its core, but I think one of the things from this book that really helps to illustrate how sometimes you think like, oh, are you going to pay me to do coaching for you? So you're going to pay me to listen to you. Like literally you're going to pay me money. So I'll just like hear you solve your own problems. Well, you can solve your own problems on your own. No, <laughs> I don't think that that's really what it is, but I totally understand how that would be an objection. Um, to wanting to start a relationship with a coach. She talks about how, and there's going to be a bunch of things that like come from other sources. She's a journalist. And so she has compacted a lot of information from a lot of studies, some of which I'll be able to refer back to what the actual primary material was. And sometimes I won't. So please forgive me if anybody gets neglected inside of that. But um she talks about how being an active listener, because I know this is a quote from somebody else. Being an active listener is not about just like leaning forward and smiling and nodding and making eye contact. Like a lot of what we've been taught about listening is that that's what it looks like when you're listening, like in school, like lean forward, you know, eyes on the prize, like, and that will show that you're connected. But that that's actually not the ideal of what active listening is because the goal of listening should be that the person who's speaking feels feels heard and feels known and um those those two things you know for me are are huge in coaching people will know that you've fully heard them and fully known them by based on how you respond and not just like this but like what you say back and a lot of times what we say back is we just want to um we want to talk and relate our own experiences, which people a lot often uh, characterize that I think is like a selfish practice. Like now I'm going to tell a story about myself. I, I don't really think that's the case. I think what the case is, is that we're desiring to let you know, like, oh my gosh, I totally know what you experienced. This is how I experienced it. And we're trying to connect. And sometimes that works, especially with relationships that we're close to. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it feels like like you're not listening when you, you take the attention and sort of turn it on to your own story, right? So I don't think that that's always a bad thing to do, to relate in that way. But in terms of creating a, an atmosphere of valuable listening for another person, 
I think it's important to step into their world and you're showing that person that not only you hear what they're saying and could even like recap the details of what they're saying, but that you can synthesize that information and you're stepping into their world and you can ask them further questions. I think we, we miss the chance to like ask another detail in and even just one question. When somebody's, somebody's telling a story and this could be somebody you just met, it could be, you could be in a sales conversation, but it also could be with your spouse. Even just asking one extra question about information that someone gives to you demonstrates that you're there inside of it and that you care and you're and you're not only interested in hearing it but you're interested in understanding it and you want to make sure that you do so questions like what was that like for you or what happened next or what have you found to be helpful in those types of situations you might not feel comfortable asking those questions verbatim to like anyone that you know but like those types of of um concepts trying to understand more what the person's experience was. And, and even just asking another detail helps people to know um, that you are engaged. So they, they pose the speaker as the expert, not the listener rushing to like save the day or like, oh, I, I get it, I get it. And let me tell you why I know that I get it, which is great sometimes, but not all the time. So I think there are a few greater gifts that you can give to somebody than to exercise genuine curiosity. So I think the scalability of the impact of genuine listening when you think about it is totally mind blowing. The author talks about um, this quote from Marilyn Manson about the Columbine shootings and he was asked, what would you have said to the perpetrators of that crime? And he said, nothing. I would have listened to what they had to say and that's what no one did. She, she goes on in the book to talk about all of the statistics about people that commit um, crimes. And yes, of course, there's we know that there's mental illness inside of a lot of those crimes. But she said, in fact, it's not psychosis. That's the that's the common denominator in these things. It's people that are feeling socially isolated. Um, and I think it just reminds me of that Mother Teresa quote, like, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Um, people that are feeling socially isolated are doing so on, on so many different levels at home, at work or school. Like, there's so many different interactions that we have with people that, that we can think about, like, the people in our own bubble and how we impact and influence them. So I, I just truly feel like this this could revolutionize things. She talks about marriage too. She talks about marriage and how like there was an exercise that they did where they were having, um, I think it was like maybe couples therapy or something and they were having married people give both each other instructions on how to do a simple thing and then also giving a stranger, so maybe it was like another person from another couple, instructions on how to do the same thing. And with their partners, they tended to be much less specific because they just assumed that their partners sort of not read their mind, but like could understand what they were saying. But that in fact wasn't the case at all. And that uh, she also says that oftentimes married people think that they don't have anything to talk about, but it's really because they like think they sort of know everything about the person. But have you ever been in an experience where you are um, maybe on a, a double date or something or at a party or something and somebody asks your your spouse a question and they tell a story that you're like, I didn't been with you for 15 years and I've never heard that. It's this question asking. It's this bravery to sort of get to know one another and not treat one another as though we are already experts. It's not anything malicious that we're doing but it's just something we can do better. Um, I really feel like this concept, the, the thing that it applies to the most to me, to be honest, and you're not gonna wanna hear it probably, <laughs> but is politics. Like she quotes um, some research from Pew that said that 55% of Democrats and 49% of Republicans stated that they were actually afraid of the opposing party not just like mad at them, not disgusted by them, but actually afraid of people in the other party. And I would love to know more about what that means. I, um, I know that, you know, our politics are connected to some of the things that we hold most precious and dear, like how we view, uh, things like life and marriage and, and how, um, 
just things should go. And I, and I know it's going to make me sound like just this ridiculous optimist to, to talk about how it's possible that we could change this. Cause I really do feel like, um, maybe it's true all over the world, but at least in the U S I feel like, um, many people feel like politics is a pretty lost cause. Um, we just kind of scoff when we hear that word, like, Oh yeah, <laughs> that would be nice, you know? But like, I think sometimes we forget that like politics actually starts in our families. Politics starts in our conversations on social media and like each human being has the chance to turn that tide. Like there's always probably going to be bad guys out there. There's always going to be people that are self-seeking. Um, but to me, like that, that's why I find myself in the world of coaching. I don't have any aspiration that I'm going to um, be connected with a truly bad guy or gal um, and be able to 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 by my listening help them to to not necessarily be that way however i think that there are a lot of people who are in positions of great influence who if they were simply really listened to and and not even just in a sense of like oh i'm going to listen to you and so that you have the chance to have the floor but listen to you in a way that helps you clarify your thoughts that if we were to do that with people who are in these powerful positions, who are trying to balance work and parenthood and politics and health and like never sleeping and all of these different things, people that are making decisions that affect everyone. And that is on a political level, it's also on a business level. It's just one of the reasons why I am an executive coach and, and wanna work in the business world is because there are people, real human beings living, breathing, who are making powerful decisions every day that really impact like the whole nation, like in companies there, people are making decisions and they're doing so on like two hours of sleep, or they're doing so in trying to navigate a power play relationship with their boss or whatever it is. And so as a coach, like that's where I long to be is, is in the room with those people that are trying to work through all of those pressures and helping them really examine what are the factors that are weighing on me right now and how can I rearrange those things to be a greater gift um, to the country, to my family, to the world. I want to work with people who, who want to do that. So I think listening is a huge key to that. And uh, I recommend reading that book highly. It's an easy read. Uh, it's great on audiobook, and Here's to better listening. Thank you.